Work? Yes. Okay. Is that too loud? Okay. Hello, I'm uh, Craig Callender. I'm a professor in the philosophy department, and welcome to uh, our annual uh, Ethics in the Public Sphere event. Um, let me begin with just a couple of remarks about the idea of the series. Um, so UC San Diego is one of the greatest producers of technological, medical, and scientific innovations in a world where these innovations are occur occurring at an increasingly rapid speed. Examples include human, human genetic engineering, uh, synthetic biology, uh, healthcare technologies, big data. Yet the pace of these discoveries often outstrips our understanding of the ethical issues that such developments raise and our ability to respond with responsible social policies and ethical guidelines, both at the public and individual uh, levels. The faster society moves, the more urgent it is to ask, what is the proper ethical stance we should take toward innovations in these different areas of human engagement? Ethics is the study of, you know, broadly speaking, of what should and shouldn't be done. Today, as a society, we are faced with innumerable pressing questions that need an ethical understanding. What principles of distributive justice should regulate the allocation of scarce uh, uh, health care resources? Should priority be given to the worst off or to achieving the greatest health benefits? Should priority be given to extending lives or to improving their quality? What is informed consent, and under what conditions is it required? Under what, which conditions should a person be taken off life support when relatives and doctors disagree? Uh, this Ethics in the Public Sphere series is intended to tackle these kinds of questions, uh, try to fill the gap between the in innovation in, uh, in science and our ethical responses. Uh, today's speaker, uh, Charles uh, Bayar, is the spe perfect speaker for this series. Uh, the case and challenges he describes arise from very recent advances at the intersection of medical engineering, neuroscience, and medicine. In fact, the, ca the case depends on advances that weren't you know, around prior to 2006. Um, Charles received a, he's both a philosopher and a doctor. He's received an MD uh, from Alberta and a PhD from, in philosophy from McGill. He's the Canadian Research Chair in Bioethics at Western University in London, Ontario. He holds appointments in philosophy and medicine, epidemiology, and biostatistics. Bio He's co-founder of Western's uh, uh, Science and Values Institute uh, called the uh, Rotman Institute. He's worked with the uh, World Health Organization, the UN, and the U.S. National Academy's Institute of Medicine. And so, oh, I, oh, I forgot about this picture here. Uh, so the, the dean gave me this picture uh, as a sort of, uh, you know, one, one picture uh, summary of why uh, it's important to have the humanities and ethics involved with uh, science. Anyway, uh, please join me in welcoming Charles. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Craig, and, and, and thanks to all of you for, for coming this afternoon. It's, it's an absolute um, privilege to um, have the invitation and have the opportunity to speak to you about uh, some of some of my work and some of the things my colleagues and and my students have been working on. As you've heard, I'm I'm from the Rotman Institute of uh, Philosophy at uh, at Western, and the Rotman Institute is where philosophers engage scientists to make a difference in the world, and so we're running a whole. Uh, network, a whole series of, of research programs in that direction. And what I want to share with you today is uh, information about one of our uh, research collaborations between philosophers and neuroscientists and others about the ethics of neuroimaging after severe brain injury. I'm going to start, though, in, uh, with reference to an earlier age and a story that, that all of you will be familiar with, uh, the story of Prometheus. Prometheus, of course, was, was a titan who stole fire from Olympus and shared the knowledge of how to make fire with humankind. He wasn't supposed to do that. And Zeus punished him by binding him for eternity to a rock. 
The poet Shelley speaks of Prometheus's sufferings uh, most graphically, and let me share some of Shelley's description with you here. He says, no change, no pause, no hope, yet I endure. The crawling glaciers pierce me with the spears of their moon freezing crystals. The bright chains eat with their burning cold into my bones. Heaven's winged hound polluting from thy lips, his beak in poison not his own, tears up my heart. And shapeless sights come wandering by, the ghastly people of the realm of dream mocking me. In my talk today, I want to talk about a different kind of bondage, not a bondage of the body, but a bondage of consciousness itself. The sort of bondage of consciousness that occurs all too frequently after, after severe brain injuries. I want to tell you in particular one person's story, the story of um, Scott Routley, um, a remarkable uh, young man. Of course, I'm not going to share any confidential information about, about Scott today. All of the information I'll be telling you about uh, is gleaned from a BBC Panorama program from 2012 and a Maclean's Magazine article in, in 2013. Scott was a remarkable uh, person. Um, he studied honors physics at the University of Waterloo. He had a promising career in robotics until, uh, unfortunately, one day uh, in December of 1999 in Sarnia, uh, Ontario, just outside of London, Ontario, he was driving with his girlfriend and they left his grandfather's house and only a few blocks away from the house uh, for reasons unknown, they collided with a police cruiser. His girlfriend and the police officer both walked away from the accident uh, unharmed with only minor injuries. Scott only had a single injury, and it was a head injury. And unfortunately, his injury was um, very severe indeed. Traumatic brain injury, like the injury that Scott suffered is a very important social problem. In the United States, every year, over 1.3 million people end up in emergency rooms with traumatic brain injuries. 275,000 of those are hospitalized, and more than 52,000 Americans every year die as a result of, of these injuries. By definition, anyone with a severe traumatic brain injury is comatose after injury. They're intubated, they're ventilated, uh, and treated in an intensive care unit. Outcome is highly variable. Some patients make a good recovery, thank goodness. Others enter into a vegetative state, yet others become minimally conscious, and about a third of patients die as a result of their injuries. Of the survivors, um, roughly 50% have uh, ongoing serious cognitive deficits or require um, assistance in their, in their daily living. So truly severe traumatic brain injury is a catastrophic uh, injury. All of these patients suffer um, some disorder of consciousness. Consciousness can, can be usefully thought of as having two components broadly. Arousal, or the degree to which one is awake or alert, on the one hand, and awareness on the other hand. That is awareness of oneself and awareness of the environment around oneself. After a traumatic brain injury, when it's severe, all patients end up in a coma. And that is they are neither awake nor aware of themselves or their environment. After a period of time, some of them can emerge into a, an unusual state called a vegetative state. And that's a state where these two main components of consciousness actually dissociate from one another. So a patient may be awake, but remains completely unaware of himself or his environment. 
yet other patients become minimally conscious, and that's a state in which they're awake, but they have only fluctuating low levels of awareness of themselves or their, or their environment. Collectively, these are referred to as disorders of consciousness. After a severe brain injury, families of patients like Scott have many questions for the healthcare team. I mean, first and foremost is going to be, is he going to survive? After that, will he regain consciousness? And how much functional recovery will there be? Will patients like Scott be able to communicate? Will they be able to care for themselves? Will they have relationships? Will they be able to work? Unfortunately, predicting outcome is one of the most difficult challenges for neurologists looking after, after these patients. Yes, there are current predictors that, that neurologists use to try and answer families who have these pressing questions. This is a list of sort of the best current um, prognostic indicators for traumatic brain injury. The purpose of this chart is not the details. It's to remind me to tell you that broadly, these prognostic indicators come from the neurologist's examination of the patient, so clinical exam. It comes from electrophysiology testing, such as a test called a somatosensory evoked potential that checks for intact connections between nerves in the arm and the somatosensory cortex in the brain. EEG, and of course, uh, structural imaging that looks at the damage that's being done to these patients' brains. If you look closely at these statistics, for those of you who are statistically minded, you'll see that none of these, with one exception, um, are very robust predictors of outcome. Only absent somatosensory evoked potentials really give us a very strong sense that, um, of how a patient is going to do. Most patients end up in a sort of indeterminate category in which uh, neurologists and other treating physicians really just aren't sure how much recovery they're going to make. And of course, that's a very difficult position for healthcare providers and families to be, to be in. One of the real challenges of the lack of prognostic information is that after a catastrophic injury to the brain like this, families are faced with questions as to whether we should continue care or not. There's a lot of withdrawal of care that happens after uh, severe brain injuries. Turgeon and colleagues did a study of over 700 patients with uh, severe brain injury across six level one trauma centers in Canada in 2011. They found that uh, the majority of deaths, 70%, were preceded by treatment withdrawals. And many of these withdrawals occurred within the first three days of injury. That's not very long, and it caused the authors to conclude that in some instances, this may be too early for accurate neuroprognostication. They also observed that mortality rates differed widely from one center to the next. And when they adjusted for the severity of injury, that didn't explain the variation among centers. That caused the authors to say, this raises the concern that differences in mortality between centers may be partly due to variation in physicians' perceptions of long-term prognosis. The great difficulty here is that with so much withdrawal of care happening in this context, withdrawal in a sense becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. We don't know how many of the patients for whom care is withdrawn would have done well had care been continued. And as a result, we urgently need better prognostic markers, especially markers of good outcomes to inform health providers and families as they make decisions. Scott survived the period of, of acute injury, and he was diagnosed as being in a vegetative state. That's a state that some refer to as, as kind of eyes open unconsciousness. These are patients who have normal sleep-wake cycles, 
They, they move, but not purposefully. They make sounds, they tear, they grimace, they smile. But they have no awareness of themselves or their environment. And they're incapable of purposeful behavior or communication. After some time, Scott was transferred to a chronic care hospital where he resided for 12 years. Um, and he was examined regularly by a neurologist, in fact, one of the leading neurologists in, in coma in the world, repeatedly over that 12-year period. And every time, Scott was diagnosed as being vegetative. This is a picture of, of, of Scott while um, he was residing in, in London, Ontario. Um, and and those, are, those are Scott's um, parents. Traumatic brain injury um, is a catastrophe for families, not just patients. Um, Scott's parents are also amazing people. And as they describe it, they both retired the day of his accident. Why? To, to take care of them. Uh, they moved their house. They moved into a small bungalow just outside of London, Ontario. As I mentioned, from, from a medical point of view, Scott's diagnosis never changed. The neurologist consistently came to the conclusion that he was in a vegetative state and that he was completely unaware of um, himself or his environment. His parents disagreed, though. Um, they spend more time with Scott than anybody else. And they said, well, you know, we, respectfully, we don't think that's quite right. Um, in fact, they said he enjoys listening to Phantom of the Opera and Les Miserables, and we can tell. His face is expressive. He blinks. He does thumbs up for, for positives, so he communicates at least minimally with them. And you might think, well, that's, that's probably unusual. But, but actually, it isn't. Um, this is actually more the rule with families of patients like this. In one study from, from quite a while ago, um, they looked at um, about three dozen families of patients in um, vegetative state and found that over 90% of these families believed that the, their vegetative loved one had some kind of awareness. They, they knew when someone was holding their hand. They knew when a loved one was in the room. They could taste food. They could hear. They could um, perhaps even communicate in, in some ways with family members. And so it's an interesting question here. Who's right? The neurologists? Um, or is it possible that sometimes the families are actually right about this? It's very difficult to tell, of course, because these patients are completely behaviorally non-responsive. So they can't show this through behavior. So how on earth could we gain access into trying to figure out um, whether there's more going on in the minds of some of these patients? Well, enter my colleague. Adrian Owen and uh, his team at, at Western. They're using a variety of neuroimaging techniques, including electroencephalography, sort of detecting electrical currents on the surface of, of um, the scalp, and functional magnetic resonance imaging that I'll say a little bit more about in a minute. And they're using these neuroimaging techniques to map residual cognitive function in behaviorally non-responsive patients like Scott. They're not just interested in, in conscious awareness. They're interested in a wide variety of cognitive functions, including sound processing, word recognition, semantic processing, command following, and the ability even to follow complex narratives, among other things. One of the main tools they use in examining or working with patients like Scott is functional magnetic resonance imaging. And that's a, a kind of technology that allows neuroscientists to measure brain activity by tracking blood flow uh, changes, more specifically changes in blood oxygenation. It's a non-invasive procedure that involves putting a patient inside of a very powerful magnet 
And that magnetic field, in fact, alters the properties of hemoglobin and al allows them to distinguish between hemoglobin that's carrying oxygen and hemoglobin that isn't carrying oxygen. And so fMRI can be used to detect where and to what extent hemoglobin is deoxygenating in the brain, and this is a marker of brain activity. fMRI provides highly detailed three-dimensional uh, images of the brain and brain activity in a living, functioning uh, human being. So how have they been using this? Well, they've been using this in part to try and detect covert conscious awareness in, in these patients. And it turns out that's a really difficult thing to do. One of the difficulties is that um, in uh, neuroimaging uh, research of this sort generally, often one is interested in locating a particular cognitive function to some part or parts of the brain. And neuroscientists will do that by studying a group of people and kind of averaging the effects across that group. In this case, though, it doesn't do us any good to say that a group of people is on average consciously aware. We want to know whether a particular patient herself is consciously aware. And so here, the, the unit of inference for this kind of study has to be the individual and not the group, and that's a very difficult thing to do. A second difficulty is we know that a variety of cognitive functions can um, operate in the absence of consciousness. So if someone is unconscious, for instance, if they're anesthetized, and one reads words to them, that will predictably cause brain activity in the acoustic cortex, right? So we have to think of tests that are, that are in a sense, more clever. There's no way of putting someone in, a, in an fMRI machine and just collecting an image, and that image alone will tell us they're consciously aware. In fact, we need to devise a much more complex experiment in order to provide robust evidence of conscious awareness. And it was Adrian Owen's team who, who came up with this really sort of clever experiment that uses fMRI as its core technology. <clears throat> One of the reasons the, the experiment is clever is because it, it uses the clinical standard for conscious awareness. So patients with head injuries who are rolled into emergency departments across America are examined by physicians who will say, open your eyes. And if the patient is able to open her eyes and follow that command, that tells the physician that very likely this person is consciously aware. They might say, raise your right hand. They might say, is your name Jane? And if a patient can follow all of those commands successfully, then from a clinical standpoint, that's sufficient evidence that they're consciously aware. Of course, patients who are in vegetative states can't open their eyes on command or raise their hand or say out loud that their name is Jane. So what they did was come up with two mental imagery tasks. One was to ask patients to imagine that you're playing tennis. And predictably, when people are asked that, an area of their brain called the supplementary motor cortex will, will light up. The second mental imagery task invited patients to, walk from, to imagine walking from room to room. And when people do that, spatial navigation areas of the brain, of the brain light up. Each of these mental imagery tasks was presented in a paired format, right? So there's a 30-second block saying, imagine doing this mental imagery task. And that was paired with a 30-second block that said, relax, all right? And then these 60-second blocks were then presented in a random order um, to both healthy volunteers and patients. Crucially, healthy volunteers um, in, in this study um, were able to complete these, all of these tasks successfully. And what I mean by that 
is that blinded assessors could look at the fMRI imagery and 100% of the time say whether the individual was imagining playing tennis, imagining walking through their house, or resting. 100% of the time. And that's the crucial bit. It's the fact that it's that sensitive that allows um, neuroscientists to make inferences at the level of the individual um, patient. So just graphically then, or more figuratively, let, let me show you what, what patients were asked to do. So they were placed inside of an MRI scanner. Their brain was imaged, and the fMRI was looking for areas of activity in the brain as signified by basically oxygen use in the brain. Patients were asked to imagine playing tennis. And if they could successfully do that, then their supplementary motor area would light up. And then they were invited to relax, and that signal would go away. The next block they were randomized to might invite them to imagine walking through your house. And if they could successfully do that, the spatial navigation parts of their brain would light up. And then they were invited to relax, and those signals would go away. OK. So what do these images actually look like? Well, this is, this is, these are actual images from, from a, a patient and a control. This is what it looks like in fMRI when both patient and control are invited to imagine playing tennis. And this is what it looks like when they're asked to imagine um, walking from room to room in their house. And the important thing to note here is that the fMRI images between patient and control are completely indistinguishable. They're the same. OK, what about Scott? Well, Scott was placed in a scanner and administered the mental imagery task, and he could do it. He imagined playing tennis. He imagined walking through his house. He did so on command. And importantly, he stopped doing it on command. And he did it over and over and over again. His neurologist reacted um, with surprise, I think it's fair to say. Uh, I, I know him. He is absolutely a world-leading neurologist and expert on coma. He said, I was impressed and amazed that he was able to show these cognitive responses. He had the clinical picture of a typical vegetative patient and showed no spontaneous movements that looked meaningful. How did the parents react? The parents were not surprised. Right? The mother said, we weren't surprised at all. It was just, well, now somebody believes us. When um, a large group of patients who were vegetative and minimally conscious were administered the, 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 the mental imagery task uh, by Monty, a paper published in the New England Journal in 2010, they found that fully 17%, or almost one in five vegetative patients, were able to follow commands in the scanner and therefore are consciously aware. And that's just not supposed to be. Well, the mental imagery task, at least administered in this way, only gets us, only gets us so far, right? We have evidence, I mean, very startling evidence, that at least a subset of patients who are vegetative, in fact, have covert conscious awareness. The challenge, though, is we don't know really anything about the contents of their consciousness. We don't know what's going on in their brains. We know they're conscious, but we don't know um, um, what their mental states are. We don't know what it's like to be them. So the mental imagery task was again modified by Owen and his team for communication. This time, what they did was place a patient in a scanner and ask them a question. And then they said, if the answer is yes, imagine playing tennis. If the answer is no, imagine walking from room to room in your house. 
And this has resulted in successful communication to date with three vegetative or minimally um, conscious patients. A remarkable thing. And one of those patients was, was Scott. Um, let, me, let me tell you what he said. They asked him, is a banana yellow? He said, yes. Your name is Scott? Yes. Your name Mike? No. Is the year 1999? No. Is the year 2012? Yes. What's the name of your support worker? He got it right. Do you like watching ice hockey on TV? He's Canadian, so he said yes. <laughs> of course. Silly question. Are you in pain? No. Scott was the first person in the world to provide clinically relevant information through a brain-computer interface. He wasn't supposed to be consciously aware at all, and he certainly wasn't supposed to be able to communicate. And now he's able to answer a question like, are you in pain? Potentially transformative stuff for brain injured patients everywhere. Potentially. But managing the, the translation of this neuroscience research into the clinical setting raises a lot of really difficult questions. And some of those questions are, are ethical questions. Questions for researchers, clinicians, patients, and families. And so three years ago, Adrian, and Owen, Adrian Owen and I set up a research collaboration to work together on, on some of these questions to responsibly navigate the translation of this technology from the neuroscience lab into the clinic. Our collaboration involves neuroscientists, neurologists, neuropsychologists, epidemiologists, medical sociologists, and yes, philosophers. And we're working together to identify and analyze key ethical issues and to provide guidance to researchers, clinicians, and families. Importantly, we're actually integrated with the science. <clears throat> so Adrian's team has a five-year grant from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. They are currently um, collecting 2013 through 2018, the largest cohort of brain injured patients uh, in the world and um, scanning them for um, evidence of covert uh, cognitive abilities. So that's a project that runs through 2018. We now have um, a, a coordinated research project that involves members of, of Adrian's team that's running in parallel with the work that they're doing to, in a sense, in live time, have philosophers engage with scientists on the practice, on the, on the problems that they're actually facing in their daily practice. We published our study protocol in BMC Medical Ethics uh, last year. If you're interested in sort of a more detailed description of our research program, I invite you to have a look at it. It's, it's available um, open access. What I'd like to do is, um, in the time that remains, um, tell you about sort of four questions, just briefly four questions that we're thinking about um, and where we are in our, our thinking uh, about them. We, we certainly haven't, haven't answered them all, um, but, but let me tell you what those questions are. The first question is, should neuroimaging results like this be shared with the family at all? Right? After all, remember that, that these, these neuroimaging tests are not being conducted in the clinic. They're being conducted in a research context. There is an understanding in, in clinical research that the overall results of a particular study ought to be shared with, with research participants. 
but rarely, in fact, are individual level results shared with either patients or, or families, right? So the question here is, do researchers, uh, do these neuroscience researchers have an ethical obligation to disclose individual research results to families? Well, the, the families are clear about this. They say, yeah, we want, we want to know what you found, right? We're very interested in what you found. But um, I think there, uh, there are reasonable sort of things to consider here. We might want to consider, well, are these results reliable? Um, are families going to understand this information? And do the benefits of disclosure outweigh, outweigh the harms? So um, we ran a project on this and published our findings last year in the Journal of, of Medical Ethics. And what we did was define four criteria to define, to, um, to guide the disclosure of individual level research results um, generally. And then we applied them to, to the case of neuroimaging studies like I've just described. So the first criterion is that disclosure will not seriously impair the scientific validity of the study. In the case of the, the, the neuroimaging um, work that I've discussed, all of these are single patient experiments. Remember I said the level of inference here was the individual patient. So therefore, once an experiment is complete, the disclosure of individual research results does not impair scientific validity, right? So it's different, say, from a randomized controlled trial where actually giving the family um, the, res the individual level results can uh, impair the blinding of the study. So this is different from that. The second criterion says the research result is informative and reasonably reliable. Here again, we think, we argue, that um, the neuroimaging results with respect to um, covert conscious awareness pass uh, a, a reasonable understanding of this test. First off, it relies on an established model of conscious awareness assessment that's, that's used in the clinic every day, namely command following behavior. Beyond that, we know from studies with healthy participants that um, the accuracy, at least in healthy participants, is, is 100%. The third criterion is that the benefits of disclosure outweigh the harms to the research participant. These tests reveal important information about the cognitive functioning of uh, an otherwise behaviorally non-responsive patient. We learn as a result of these positive findings that someone has the capacity to hear, that they can understand speech, that their short-term memory is at least to some degree intact, and they have some degree of executive um, function. All of that is important information. Beyond that, they are, in some sense, moral persons. When we discover that someone is um, covertly, consciously aware, um, we learn something about them morally as well as neuroscientifically, and I think we have an obligation to acknowledge them as such. There may be important pragmatic implications of this, though, as well. Knowing that a person can understand speech, right, can tell not only the family, but also healthcare providers to talk to the patient. And I can only imagine that that actually might be an enormously meaningful thing to someone who's vegetative but covertly aware. Of course, we also think that the proxy decision maker needs to provide informed consent to the disclosure of this, of this information. And uh, that families should be asked before the information is disclosed, is disclosed to them. So that's one question we've been interested in. A second question is, is what's the impact of neuroimaging results on, on families? And um, not enough is known about this. Um, that's certainly true. Families, of course, uh, like Scott's family, play an enormously important role in uh, severe brain injury. They make medical decisions on behalf of their loved ones. They administer care, often on a daily basis, and they bear the burden of chronic illness and uncertainty. 
But what's the effect of receiving neuroimaging results going to have on families? Well, we're not sure. One can imagine that positive results may lead to optimism. But it also means, very likely, if someone is covertly consciously aware, that they may also be sentient. That is, they may also be able to experience pain and suffering. So that might um, potentially have an effect on families as they worry about that. What about negative results? I mean, that, in a sense, may lead to denial on the part of families. It may lead to confusion. So really, the question is, how should families be informed of neuroimaging results to maximize their comprehension and minimize, minimize harm? Well, there are a variety of ways that one might approach this. Um, uh, a, a lot of people to date have just kind of speculated about this and have said things like, well, we don't think families can understand complex information like this. Um, that hasn't, hasn't been our approach. We thought we'd talk to families. Um, and so we've designed and we're in the midst of conducting a qualitative interview study. And we're seeking to gain insight through this study into families' knowledge of the patient's medical condition, including their beliefs about the pres patient's preserved cognitive functioning. Why are they enrolling in, in the neuroimaging study? What are they hoping to get out of it? Are they hoping there'll be benefits for the patient, him or herself? And that's loud. Um, what is their experience of research participation? And, and what can they tell us about how can we do this better? Right? I mean, why not just ask them, how can we do this better? Uh, so that's what we're doing. We're interviewing about 20 family members of patients who have been diagnosed with vegetative state or minimally conscious state and are participating in one of Owen's neuroimaging studies. All of the patients are at least one year post-injury, and all of them have a surrogate decision maker. We're conducting two hour to hour and a half long interviews before and after the neuroimaging results. And um, to date, we've conducted a total of six interviews with three families. Um, and are developing a preliminary coding framework. Um, I can't say too much about our results yet. Um, I can say the stories that families are sharing with us are um, extraordinary, uh, truly extraordinary, uh, uplifting, at times difficult to read. Um, across six interviews, we have over 150 pages of transcripts so far. So I think the lessons we are going to learn from just talking to families are going to be enormously valuable. Um, they are going to raise ethical issues that none of us have thought of. So I think this is very important. The third question is, should patients who can communicate via neuroimaging make their own treatment decisions? And this is one of the first things that uh, came out after the publication of, of the Monty uh, study in 2010 was, well, you know, um, some patients seem to be able to answer yes or no questions, so, so we should just ask them about life or death decisions. Um, here's an example from 2010. Um, it says, imagine rushing to the hospital because your loved one has had a serious brain injury. You were asked about any end of life care preferences and whether you will agree to a do not resuscitate order. If only you could ask. Now imagine rolling your loved one down to the hospital's MRI machine and asking him if he wants to live or die by reading his responses on the scanner. Well, um, you know, so this grabs the reader's attention, right? Um, but I think there are some real problems with, with this scenario. One is the authors of this are not talking about patients like Scott. They're talking about acutely brain injured patients in the hours after brain injury. These patients are not vegetative or minimally conscious. They're comatose. And to date, no comatose, no acutely comatose patient has ever demonstrated covert conscious awareness. And no acutely comatose patient has ever demonstrated the capacity to communicate. 
I'd be surprised if anyone does. So um, there's a problem with this scenario. Another problem with the scenario is the way that it highlights life or death decisions as well. And I think there are a lot of other decisions that um, we might perhaps more fruitfully think about in this patient population. The core conceptual problem here is that before you ask a question, you need to know what to do with the answer, right? And to know what to do with uh, an answer to a question about a treatment decision, you need to know whether that patient, in fact, has decision-making capacity. So you need to establish that the patient first can responsibly make decisions for themselves before sensibly asking them whether they want a particular treatment. There's been a lot of skepticism in the bioethics literature um, about our ability to assess decision-making capacity in this, in this setting. Authors have pointed out that patients with severe brain injuries commonly lack decision-making capacity. Well, you know, that's true, right? but some patients recover the capacity for decision-making capacity, and we're really interested whether any patient has the capacity to make their own decisions. Other authors have pointed out um, correctly that features of neuroimaging communication, the fact that currently we're only able to ask yes or no uh, questions that have yes or no answers, we're only able to ask a limited number of questions, make it really difficult to assess decision-making capacity practically. Um, and finally, they pointed out that the answers may be subject to misinterpretation. And I think all of that's just true. And in some sense, I guess, I think we feel like we knew that. Um, you know, and from our point of view, um, all of this just says, yes, it's going to be really difficult to do this. We know that. And we're curious about whether it can be done at all. So we're just starting with this now, but this is our initial thinking. We're developing a two-step process here to develop, to assess decision-making capacity. The first takes advantage of the fact that these patients undergo um, a, a whole battery of neuropsychological testing in the scanner and with, with EEG. And in order to map residual cognitive function. And so what we're interested in doing is using the data that's already being gathered on these patients and focus in on cognitive functions that are relevant to decision-making capacity, things like language comprehension, memory, executive function, and so on. And then we're interested in kind of identifying gaps. What are the gaps in our, in our knowledge about, about this patient's abilities? Um, Reasoning might be, might be one. That's something that's not commonly covered in the battery of, of tests that these patients go under. And here we're thinking that uh, one possible solution to this would invoke sort of a high-level function task where you'd ask them sort of a really difficult reasoning problem. And if they could do that, then that would tell you that, in fact, they have a relatively high level of reasoning um, preserved. So I think that first step, as I've described it, helps give reassurance that a particular patient, in, in a sense, has, has um, the requisite cognitive architecture to possibly support decision-making capacity. But decision-making capacity is decision-specific, right? So we need a second step that's going to, in fact, ask patients about um, their understanding, appreciation, and choice about a particular medical decision. And we're thinking that in a series of eight or 10 questions, we could plausibly perhaps address that in a single MRI um, session. We're not starting with end-of-life decisions, and I don't know that we'll ever get to end-of-life decisions. I'm not sure we ever should but uh, we're actually starting in low-stakes decisions. In fact, the sorts of treatment decisions that chronically ill patients like this face every day. Do you want physio more often? Do you want to be turned more often? Do you want the TV on to the hockey game, right? Do you want opera on the radio? Really quotidian stuff. And it, it may not sound significant, 
But patients with neurological disabilities in, in, in other settings, like uh, high-level um, quadriplegics, when interviewed about quality of life, consistently report that the most important thing to the quality of their life is actually any degree of control or independence they can have. It doesn't matter whether it's large or small. What matters is any additional independence we can give these individuals. And therefore, I think, actually, these low-stakes quotidian treatment decisions hand over to these patients some degree of control back into their lives, and that can be enormously important. The final question is, is what is the quality of life of a severely brain-injured patient? We all have intuitions about this. It's commonly presumed that the lives of patients who are vegetative or minimally conscious are not good lives. How do we know? Right? Um, indeed, some people have suggested that, that the fact that some vegetative patients are now demonstrated to be consciously aware might actually be a reason to withdraw treatment from them and let them die. So Wilkinson and, and colleagues, uh, Guy Kahane and Julian Sabulescu at Oxford, have said, if such patients suffer, they can be harmed by continuing treatment. There may be stronger reasons in terms of non-maleficence and the best interests of the patient to allow them to die. Well, you know, if they're in fact suffering terribly, and if in fact there's nothing we can do about it, then that might be true. But we don't know that, right? And in fact, I think we have little or no insight into what it's like to be vegetative and covertly aware. And it seems in other cases where we have strong intuitions, we turn out to be wrong about um, questions of quality of life. So locked-in syndrome is, is a case where uh, patients have intact minds, but due to a very specific um, sort of lesion in their brain, um, they end up being completely paralyzed and, in fact, are only able to communicate through preserved vertical movements of their eyes. If asked, what do you think the quality of life is of someone in a locked-in state, most people would say, I'm quite confident that it's not good. Well, Bruno in 2011 had the excellent idea of asking patients who are locked in how they feel about it. Really good idea. And a majority of them said they were happy, while only a minority were miserable. Isn't that remarkable? Um, human beings adapt, and uh, patients with neurological disabilities surely adapt. We need to develop um, protocols for the treatment of brain-injured patients who, who may be capable of, of experiencing pain and suffering, importantly, to prevent pain and to use a stepwise approach to, to treat pain. Those protocols don't, don't currently exist. Our approach uses an ethics of welfare that requires, where possible, that we, in fact, communicate with patients after severe brain injury and allow them to report on their own subjective quality of life. Of course, that's a very difficult thing to do, and we're working on developing a systematic approach to assess quality of life in communicating patients um, who are vegetative or minimally um, conscious. You might sort of think, well, they can only answer yes or no questions, so you couldn't possibly get at um, what their lives are like. I think it's very difficult. And let me just show you a list of questions, just as an illustration, that we could ask potentially in a single scanning session. Do you feel as though you get enough food? Do you feel unsafe? Do you have moderate or severe bodily pain almost every day? Do you have trouble understanding what people say to you? Are you happy when people talk to you? Do you have a lot of energy? Do you have trouble remembering things? Do you feel so down in the dumps that nothing can cheer you up 
you feel calm and peaceful? Are you interested in other people? Do you feel like a burden to your family? Potentially, we could ask all of those questions in a single session. We're not sure if, if those are the right questions. A lot of work has to be done. But I just use that as an illustration of the potential um, that we see here. My main message, though, really, is that um, collaboration is enormously important um, as we work with neuroscientists on these issues. Over the last 10 years, our understanding of brain injury has been overturned. And I think it's fair to say that neuroimaging holds a real promise to improve our ability to accurately diagnose uh, patients and to offer better information about their likely outcome to loved ones. But crucially, the responsible adoption of neuroimaging and clinical practice raises really difficult ethical issues. And I think dealing with those requires real collaborations among neuroscientists, clinicians, philosophers, and yes, with families, um, too. So I started out telling you the story of, of Scott Radley. And Scott's an amazing person. He taught us uh, a great deal about the abilities of at least some severely brain injured patients. He turned out to be covertly consciously aware. That was supposed to be impossible. He turned out to be capable of communication, and he wasn't supposed to be able to do that either. And he's answered more questions uh, than any other patient to date using a brain computer interface. Truly, I think it's fair to say that, that, that Scott has brought us fire from, from Olympus. Um, sadly, uh, Scott passed away um, in, uh, in September of, of, of 2013. He was um, only 40 years old. Uh, the poet Shelley uh, retells the, the legend of Prometheus um, a, bit, a bit differently than the classical version. In the classical version, um, Zeus sort of forgives Prometheus and relieves, releases him from his, from his chains. <clears throat> but Shelley changes uh, the story for important reasons. Um, he casts Zeus as a kind of tyrant who has to be overthrown by, by Prometheus uh, the romantic hero and, and the revolutionary. And, and I guess, uh, for me, that's, that's actually how I, how I think of, of Scott. To suffer woes which hope thinks infinite. To forgive wrongs darker than death or night. To defy power which seems omnipotent. To love and bear, till hope to hope, till hope creates from its own wreck the thing it contemplates, neither to change nor falter nor repent. This, like thy glory, Titan, is to be good, great and joyous, beautiful and free. This alone, life, joy, empire, and victory. 